Hey, YouTube, Sven. Chances are, if you click this video, you would like to make a knife. Most prominently, when looking at knife making videos, you will see this thing, which is a 2x72 belt grinder. This one, I've built myself. Up, up, up. Who cares? You probably don't have one, and today I want to show you that you don't need one. First thing we'll need is a piece of steel. I've got some 75 CR1 knife steel, but you could also just use an old saw blade. I made my first knife out of a saw blade, but I'll guarantee you that a $10 flat bar makes for much better results. Now I sketched out the shape of my knife, which is going to be a Puko, and I would also recommend that you start with a little pocket knife as well, since we've got a whole lot of sawing and filing ahead of us. The edges of my flat bar were pretty hard, so I had to anneal them before I could start sawing. I guess it work hardened when my supplier cut them, so don't be alarmed when this happens to your steel as well. To anneal, I hit it with the propane torch we are going to need later for hardening. And now began the fun part of sawing out the rough shape of my knife. Now that this is finally done, I think the hard part is already over. Next we're going to file out the finer shape of this. Now for the next step we have to file the bevels. You could just do this freehand and probably still get a functional knife, but if you want to be a little bit fancier, a file guide helps to make perfectly symmetrical bevels. For the jig we'll be needing a piece of wood for the base. If it already has some blood on it, great. If not, you can skip this step. I already went ahead and glued a block at one end of the board, which is going to determine the bevel angle we'll be filing, so choose the height accordingly. Now just clamp the jig to your workspace, zip tie a file to some kind of rod, Perfect flu. Let me play this. Hmm. Okay. Maybe it's just a guiding stick. And add some screws to the angle block to prevent the rod from sliding off. Lastly, clamp your knife securely to the end of the board and you've got yourself a functional jig. I should have set it stop so that the tang isn't beveled to make fitting the bolster easier, but you'll see what I mean in just a second. An easy way to add some decoration is by doing some file work. For that I cleaned up the spine and then evenly marked where I want the pattern to be. As you can see, you don't even need calipers for this. With just two lines at either side it looked a bit odd, so I roughly marked the middle between those with the fork and added two extra lines. To fix the tang for the bolster I clamped it to the jig again to add the bevel angle to the tang as well. As you can see I messed up the second side because the bevel tang no longer sat flush on the base of the jig. To clean up this mess I used a 120 grit sandpaper with a piece of hardwood to blend everything together. If you didn't mess up like I did, you can use a piece of metal as backing to get a very crisp edge at the grind line. To add a fuller, I clamped a straight piece of wood parallel to the spine to act as a guide for my file. I added a second clamp as a stop and then filed one side first, then switched the stop to the other side and continued there. This worked better than I expected and only took roughly 15 minutes per side. So far this project took roughly five and a half hours. Okay, now it's time for hardening. I went ahead and sanded the blade up to 400 off camera. I'm going to show you a lot more of hand sanding after hardening. What we need is some source of heat. You could just take a torch like this, which we already used, um, preferably two, which is, I don't have a second one of these, but this is basically the same, just hooked up to a big uh, propane canister. And we need some kind of quenchant. I'm taking some vegetable oil. This is the same stuff I put in my salad. So as you can see, very simple ingredients. And we're going to fill this up. Let's heat up the oil. 
that way it's a bit more liquidy and the cooling is a bit more rapidly not as rapidly as water but it still makes for a harder edge As you can see I was struggling to keep an even heat throughout the blade because the material is too thick for this torch. If you use the saw blade this works just fine but for this thickness I needed something else. So I made a makeshift forge with some bricks and then tried it with the torch again. Which still did not produce enough heat. I used this attachment instead which you can grab at a hardware store for roughly 15 euros. As you can see hardening sort of worked, the sound of the file should be a bit higher pitched. The edges cooled off quite a bit before entering the oil, but keep in mind that I filmed this in bright daylight, which can make the metal seem much cooler than it actually is. If you spend a lot of time on your knife and you don't want to mess up the heat treat, you could also just send your knife to a professional and have them quench and temper your blade. Alright, the blade is tempered and now let's turn this ugly thing into this. I like to go 400, 600, 800, 1000, 1500, 3000 and then maybe 5000. And after that uh, the buffing wheel, but because we're not using any power tools, we're going to do that by hand. It's not as nice as uh, doing it with the buffing wheel, but I think it still looks quite good. It makes a, a little bit of a difference. Okay, so now with uh, the next grid we want to see if we got all these scratches from the previous grid out you can kind of see the scratches right here if we're sanding in this direction again we can't see if we got all the 400 grid scratches out so we have to sand in another direction and i like to go straight and then diagonal but because we can't do this in the fuller, I mean, if you really want to have very, very shiny mirror finish, um, even in the fuller, you could uh, lay the file down in here and then pull the sandpaper to get the another scratch direction. But I actually don't really see a real difference. So I'm just going to start with the fuller and sand the 600 grid right in here. That seems to be good. And now we're going to do the diagonal direction. And as you can see, let me just do a couple test scratches. As you can see, this looks very different to this. And as I continue, You can, maybe I can play around with the light a bit. Ah, this is good. As you can see, now we've got something that looks like a mirror with these scratches right here. And if all of them are gone, then you're going to move up to the next grid and we're going in this direction again, and then diagonal and then straight and diagonal and so forth. So let me put this into time-lapse mode to get this done. I just finished uh, 5000 grid with some straight poles where you are starting all the way at the spine, uh, not the spine, at the tank and then you are just doing some straight poles because we, I'm trying to align all those scratches on here to be very parallel have an even finish. Okay. Now that this is done, I'm taking a clean piece of cloth and I've got some polishing paste. And now usually you would take the buffing, buffing wheel and get all of this polishing paste off. But 
since we are not using any power tools roll this up a few times and we're going back and forth as fast as i can okay this looks very nice but you have to be careful when doing uh the the tip of the blade because it's very easy to slip off and then stab yourself so be careful when doing this so this one is very shiny this one is very shiny this one is also very shiny and i left this to be black to give it a nice contrast Okay, now that the blade is done, let's move over to the handle. And for that, we got some birch wood. This one that I snatched right off the firewood, whatever it's called. Okay, now, let's see. I think I'm going to cut off the ends because, as you can see, when it's drying, it's always splitting in these ends. This should be very dry because I think it was drying for maybe i don't know eight years or something like that so this should be nice handle material and as you can see no splits i can now measure ow i've got a splinter already <clears throat> okay let me just measure this with my hand so i want to be like this and then a little bit because I want to add a curve at the end. So it should be about this size. So let's cut this off. <sighs> Cutting end grain. Okay. Now you could just Use a rasp, like this one. See, it's like a file, but a bit more rough. And you could just go to town with this whole thing and shape this. But I am lucky enough to own a draw knife. So we are going to use this thing to shape our handle. This is very chunky. Okay. You know what I just noticed? I have to still drill a tang hole. And of course I want it to be somewhat straight. So I shouldn't continue doing this before I finish the tang hole. Now for the only part of the build. Where I'm using, I wouldn't even call this a power tool because I think everyone who wants to make a knife probably owns a cordless drill. You could also use a hand drill for this, but let's be honest, it's probably easier to get your hands on a cordless than a hand drill. Okay, it's a hole. And now I'll take my trusty little brooch that I made out of a jigsaw blade, as you can see. Hmm, I mean almost, I guess. This is uh, an off-cut piece from the blade. So it's the same material that the blade is made of. And now we've got a teeny tiny drill bit. And we're going to drill three holes. Roughly in the middle. Oh! Okay, now this is not supposed to happen. And this thing is really stuck. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, I've never had this happen. Um, okay. Let's see if I can get this out. Come on, you stupid drill bit. You know what? Breast looks better, anyways. I drilled some holes again and then connected them with a needle file. Got roughly the right dimensions with the tang hole. And I went ahead and filed off the chrome. 
and sanded it to 240 grit. As you can see, this thing has a slight curve and I am now going to flatten this thing out on the anvil of my vise. Doesn't have to be perfectly flat because we're going to sand down the back of it anyway. So now I want to put in a little bit of texture and for that you can use a ball peen hammer. I don't have one so I just took this diagonal hammer that I've, I've maybe got five of these. So I just made a little tip at the end. And now we're going to put a little bit of texture on it. Okay, I think this is good. As you can see, we've got a nice texture going now. And another great thing is that if there are any gaps, you can sort of hide them with this texture look. The next step is to try and flatten out the back side. I think this is already good enough. I'll wrap some leather around it. And then we're going to clamp it very tightly in the vise. And now we will hammer fit this thing onto the tang. Okay, for that I've got this little aluminum I don't know what this is called, custom profile. And we're going to gently tap on our bolster. Looking good. After flattening the handle as well, the knife was almost ready for glue up. First I had to file some notches into the tang to get the epoxy something to hold onto. This way we don't have to add any pins to the handle. As always I'm using some 5 minute epoxy to pull all the pieces tightly together. You could use a long clamp, try your luck with some rubber bands or just stand there for 10 minutes and think about your life decisions leading up to this. Now that everything was glued together I could finalize the handle shape. You could end the project right here, but I decided to add a bit more of decoration. For that I tried making a fluted handle for the first time. I marked a starting point and then used a staple clip to add evenly spaced lines. The last one didn't line up, so I just adjusted this one to be roughly in the middle of the last gap. The proper way to do this would be to measure the circumference of your handle, divide that by how many values you want and then use a caliper to trace that width onto your handle. But as I said, I want to keep the tools as simple as possible. I drew the first line by hand and then used the staple clip again to have the other ones evenly spaced as well. Then I used a triangular file to start a slot for the round file to sit in. To blend the bolster and handle together, I continued filing into the bolster as well. Now I added the coat of Danish oil to the handle. You could stop here again, but since birch is a very soft wood, I decided to coat it in CA glue to make it a lot sturdier. For that I chose a very thin CA glue and then coated the handle with multiple layers of thinly applied glue. I sanded the glue with 1000 grit in between each layer and then sanded the last layer with 1500 grit, which gives it a nice and glossy finish. Because every knife needs a house to live in, I decided to make a sheath as well. For that, grab some leather, preferably some vegetable tanned leather because that holds the water shape form very well. Add a seam so that the edge can't cut the sewing thread inside the sheath. Oil out the blade and then wrap it in cling film. In the next step I need to soak the leather in water and then pull it tightly around the knife and you surely don't want to have any rust spots after hand sanding for two hours. Clamp it down tightly and leave it to dry like this. After it's dry it should retain this form. Always add some protective leather piece between the clamp and your sheath or you'll have the imprint of your clamp in there forever. After gluing and trimming, punch the holes for your sewing thread. I bought a beginner's leather crafting kit and it came with all the tools necessary for the job. 
Cutting a groove over these holes makes the thread sit flush with the lever and protects it from getting caught on something. You could also use a knife to cut the groove. Now I'm using a wax thread with a saddle stitch. As mentioned earlier, the glued in seam is important to keep the blade edge from cutting the thread running through the lever. Looking at historical pictures, the puko was worn hanging from the belt. To make a strap for the sheath, I used a belt buckle that I cut and bent to shape to fit the brass piece right here. Okay, here I've got a piece of brass, it's one millimeter thick and we've put some leather down so we don't scratch it up unnecessarily and now I've got a piece of metal that's about the same thickness as my sheath and now we'll try to very gracefully bend this thing along the middle. Now this is going to be very loud. I don't know why I, I chose this hobby because I really don't like loud noises. But thankfully there's headphones. As you can see it's a lot thicker than this piece. I left some extra so I can now scribe a line to have it parallel to the uh, banded side. This looks horrible. I'll try widening out these slots and maybe that looks a little bit better. To hold everything together I use rapid rivets and flatten both caps to have them flush with the metal. All right, and now for the last and probably most important step, the knife has to be sharp. So I usually do it with my belt grinder, but I've recently picked up this diamond stone. I wanted to have something a little bit more sturdy and flat when I'm going to grind my gravers. So that's why I picked this up. I very, very much suck at um, hand sharpening. And yeah, let's just see if I can put a proper edge on it. Okay, you get the point. Let me probably sharpen this. If you watched the video all the way until now, thank you very much. It does help out the channel a lot. I wish you all a happy new year and I'll catch you in the next video.